the region to the west of India uh, is in great ferment. Uh, there is uh, there's a lot happening to the India's immediate west. We have uh, Pakistan, uh, where the state is tottering. This political instability, uh, which seem to be uh, out of the control of the Pakistani state or the Pakistani authorities. Uh, and then Afghanistan is increasingly getting involved uh, in, in clashes with Pakistan. Uh, there is also the issue of uh, the growing presence of international terrorist groups, although the Afghans deny it. The problem for the Pakistanis is they are not able to protect themselves. The entire uh, region is now in so much of a ferment then it would destabilize not just the countries of the region, it would in many ways destabilize the global economy. The region to the west of India uh, is in great ferment. Uh, there is uh, there's a lot happening. Uh, some of it seems that you know it's happening. It's not all connected, but at some level or the other, I think certain connections can be uh, can be can be drawn. And more importantly, uh, what is happening could start having a domino effect uh, if some kind of uh, some kind of blocks are not placed on the series of events which are taking place now. Uh, to the India's immediate west, we have uh, Pakistan, uh, where the state is tottering, there's political instability, institutional collapse, uh, there, is, uh, there is an economic collapse which, which they are uh, facing and of course, uh, there is some serious security problems uh, which have emerged, uh, which seem to be uh, out of the control of the Pakistani state or the Pakistani authorities. Further west in Afghanistan, there is, of course, a grave humanitarian crisis, which has been brewing for some time, uh, but it's getting in some ways much worse. Uh, and then Afghanistan is increasingly getting involved uh, in, in clashes with Pakistan. Uh, there is also the issue of uh, the growing presence of international terrorist groups, although the Afghans deny it, but there there is a fear of uh, a growing presence of international terrorist groups, uh, not just the ISKP, but also groups like the Al-Qaeda, uh, which are there in Afghanistan, and of course, certain regional groups, uh, which, which target uh, countries, uh, both in Central Asia, as well as in Iran and uh, Pakistan, uh, which are there in, in Afghanistan. Uh, so there are, there, are, there are growing tensions in that region. Uh, you move further west into Iran, uh, and clearly, Iran also has its own share of political turmoil. Uh, the legitimacy of the Islamic regime is being questioned out there. Uh, and Iran is embroiled in multiple small wars, both within its borders, uh, as well as outside its borders in its immediate neighborhood. Uh, and then Iran is seen uh, as a factor of great instability in the Middle East. And then whatever Iran is doing, starts having an impact on rest of the region. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a domino effect which is starting to take place, uh, which is feeding, uh, you know, each of these, uh, these, these conflicts are feeding off each other uh, and, and blowing them out of proportion. Now, uh, recently, for example, we've had, uh, we've had some very serious attacks which have taken place. Uh, in Iran, uh, there have been uh, two uh, attacks, simultaneous attacks. Uh, on two towns in, in uh, Iran's uh, Sistan Baluchistan province, carried out by a Sunni terrorist organization which is based in Pakistan uh, and seen to be operating from inside Pakistani territory. Uh, and uh, there are allegations that it is there is some kind of an American hand uh, or some kind of an Israeli hand behind this particular organization, although no proof has been ever uh, has been ever given. Uh, it's only it's only uh, kind of conspiracy theories and allegations. Uh, but groups like the Jaish Adal uh, have a reason to exist, uh, and the reasons are of course because it's at one level a sectarian group. Uh, Iran is a Shia uh, state, uh, and uh, it hasn't exactly been very fair to the Sunni minority in, uh, especially in Sistan, Balochistan. Uh, also. Uh, 
you know, the Baloch are not technically Persians uh, in that sense. So there is an ethnic difference as well. Uh, and all of this has kind of given some degree of uh, rationale, for want of a better word, uh, for groups like the Jaish-e Adal to emerge. But of course, uh, they cannot emerge in a vacuum. Somebody has to be supporting them. The fact that they are openly operating from inside Pakistan suggests that there is, of course, a Pakistani hand and perhaps some amount of tit-for-tat between Pakistan and Iran because the Pakistanis allege that Baloch freedom fighters are also based in Iran uh, and the Iranians don't uh, molest them, don't touch them allow them uh, a certain freedom of operation uh, and that affects Pakistan. So, you know, it's a kind of a tit for tat. But uh, the attacks which were launched by the Jaish-e Adal uh, in the last few days uh, have been pretty ferocious, uh, both in Chabahar port as well as in the town of Rask. Now, the, there is, of course, a, a kind of a sinister angle uh, to the targeting of Chabahar. Uh, Chabahar is seen as a rival to Gwadar which is Pakistan's great white hope for becoming the center of the global uh, trade. Uh, I, I don't know where they get these thoughts from, but this is the Pakistani rhetoric uh, that Gwadar is going to change the destiny of Pakistan and etc, etc, blah, blah, blah. The Pakistanis keep going on about it. But nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that Chabahar has a far greater potential because there are more players who are ready to be involved in Chabahar than are ready to be involved in, uh, in Gwadar. India has made significant investments and is continuing to make significant investments in Gwadar uh, and it is seen as uh, our gateway uh, into Iran, into Afghanistan and then further on into Central Asia. The Afghans themselves, the Taliban government are reported to have invested or been ready to invest something like $35 million in uh, Chabahar uh, so that they can, uh, they can diversify their trade from uh, Pakistan into Iran. So that is why Chabahar uh, seems to uh, be a kind of a target. Uh, and the moment you start attacking uh, ports like Chabahar, you undermine uh, their viability, you undermine, uh, you know, their ability to uh, function as, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a global hub, uh, or at least a regional hub for trade. There is certainly uh, that factor out there. and. Uh, and, and the Iranians have been pretty furious about it. There were apprehensions that there would be some kind of Iranian retaliation, but so far there has been none. The last times the Iranians retaliated uh, against a terror attack by launching some missiles into Pakistan, the Pakistanis hit them back and then the Iranians just, just went off to sleep. There was no follow-up action from them. So this time there's been nothing which has happened from the Iranian side. And at the same time, within a couple of days of that attack, uh, there has been uh, 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 an alleged, the Israelis have never admitted it, but there has been an uh, alleged Israeli attack on an Iranian consulate in uh, Damascus, uh, killing some very senior officials of the uh, Revolutionary Guards. And that has spiked the tensions in the region. Iran is threatening to wage war against Israel. Israel is all set to uh, take on Iran. Uh, and so, you know, we can see how that escalation uh, ladder is being climbed. Now, if this was happening out there inside Pakistan, uh, there was uh, a suicide attack uh, against uh, Chinese engineers who were working on a dam project in, in the northwest uh, of, of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, five Chinese engineers were blown apart. Uh, the Chinese are furious. In any case, the Chinese uh, seem to have understood that, you know, uh, Pakistan is at least economically a losing proposition. They have not been putting in any money in any new projects. Even the old projects uh, are turning out to be loss-making ventures. Their payments are stuck. All kinds of problems out there. And on top of that, there is this security problem. Now, the, the, the Pakistanis literally went on their knees. They, they, they were prostrating before the Chinese, from the president to the prime minister to the army chief, everybody was going and, uh, you know, literally touching the feet of the Chinese ambassador as though he was some kind of a viceroy inside Pakistan. Uh, so that's been happening and the Pakistanis are, as usual, you know, promising 
the best possible security but everybody knows that it is not going to be easy to provide the kind of security that the Pakistanis have been promising and the Chinese are very much in the crosshairs of many of the terror groups which are operating inside Pakistan for a variety of reasons. Uh, and the reasons why the Chinese are being targeted is because China is seen as a benefactor of Pakistan, number one. And number two, uh, the Chinese are also seen as a neo-colonial power who will come, who will, who will grab the resources of the region, who will uh, treat uh, the local people uh, like, like filths, keep them out, out, out of their facilities. We've seen that happen in Gwadar and other places uh, where the local uh, citizenry has been completely ignored, neglected, marginalized and alienated. So there is a lot of sentiment against the Chinese, the way they work, the way they mistreat uh, the local workers, uh, their cultural practices which do not, which are not sensitive to the local culture. And of course, uh, the fact that the Chinese are, uh, are, are benefactors of the oppressors from within Pakistan. So the Chinese are going to be in the crosshairs and it's not going to be easy for the Pakistanis to protect the Chinese. We've seen uh, these kind of attacks start ramping up. The Pakistanis are, of course, like I said, promising that uh, we, will, we will continue to protect uh, the Chinese. But the problem for the Pakistanis is they're not able to protect themselves. Uh, if you look at, start looking at the statistics, uh, it is very clear that the number of attacks which have been launched against Pakistani security forces have been, are, 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 are spiking. Uh, and the Pakistanis really are at their wits end uh, on how to respond uh, to the kind of security threats that are coming their way. Inside Afghanistan, again, there are uh, a, a variety of problems, but now the Af Afghans uh, are playing this kind of uh, very, uh, I would say, smart game. Uh, they, you know, they, they are not losing patience with the Pakistanis. They keep blowing hot and cold against the Pakistanis. When the Pakistanis threaten them, the Afghans threaten them back. Then the Afghans will, you know, step back and appeal to the good sense of the Pakistanis, string them along, lead them up the garden path. Uh, and like the latest, uh, in the latest uh, example of this, uh, a very senior Taliban official has said that, look, uh, we understand that there will be tensions inside uh, Pakistan over the kind of attacks that are taking place. We don't think war is a solution to anything. And we will, we will advise the Pakistanis to start talking to the TTP uh, 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 militants. Uh, they should start talking to them and, and come up with some kind of an acceptable solution. Now, that is not acceptable to the Pakistanis because uh, and and in, in some ways, rightly so, because the Pakistanis say that every time we talk to the TTP, uh, they, they want to use the talks to consolidate themselves, they want to use it uh, to uh, re-establish themselves, and they've done it in the past and they'll continue to do it in the future, and they have not stopped their attacks. So, the Pakistanis are not uh, ready to talk to uh, the Taliban, they see it as a trap. Uh, because the moment you talk to the Taliban, there are only two possible solutions. One is that you concede and you lose a lot of ground uh, to the TTP uh, fellows. Uh, and if you don't have uh, a, a kind of a deal with the TTP, uh, then it gives the TTP a justification to continue uh, with, with their militancy, number one. Number two, it, it gives the Afghan Taliban a justification to say that, look, we you know, uh, we, we brought you two together, we gave you the advice, uh, but if you guys can't sort out your problems, why are you dragging us into your problem? So, I think that leaves the Pakistanis in a bit of a bind. At the same time, we have to, this, the, the, the problems of security are not limited to just these three countries. Uh, they extend far beyond. We've seen uh, the attacks, the very heinous attacks in, in Moscow, uh, which have been blamed on, um, on, on ISKP. Uh, it is said, uh, we still are waiting for more information and evidence, but it is said that uh, these attacks were orchestrated from inside Afghanistan by the ISKP, which is daggers drawn with the Taliban. Now, 
because the ISKP is seen as a threat for Russia and some of the Central Asian states, uh, there is a willingness out there to start engaging with the Taliban uh, much uh, more than what they have done so far. Uh, at the same time, they've been warning the Taliban that the Taliban need to get their act together uh, to become more acceptable to the rest of the world. But that hasn't stopped the engagement. So there is that going to happen. But the, importantly, uh, these ISKP guys uh, are, are believed to uh, have been uh, Tajiks. And again, Tajikistan is also in the crosshairs of the terrorists. So there are there are there are terror groups based in Afghanistan aligned with the Taliban who are uh, who are who are fighting inside Tajikistan. And there are the ISKP guys. Uh, there are Tajiks also in, in the ISKP who are not only uh, wanting to target Tajikistan, but beyond into Russia. So the Russia gets dragged in, the, the Chinese are getting dragged in. Uh, out in, in Iran, again, there are problems with the ISKP. The Iranians are kind of engaging with the Taliban much deeper than what they've ever done in the past. Uh, but there are serious concerns, there are ideological problems between them. We'll have to see how that plays out. But there are groups like the jaish e adal who are now targeting Iran. Iran is also being targeted by the Israelis. But then the Iranians are also, uh, you know, using their own proxy groups like the Hezbollah and Hamas and others uh, to target uh, their, their, their own enemies. So, so a, a, a lot of this stuff is happening and what seems to be underway is that the entire uh, region is now in so much of a ferment that it's it's there have been plenty of sparks which have been lit uh, but one is just wondering what is that one spark which could blow up this whole region and if that was to happen then it would destabilize not just the countries of the region it would in many ways destabilize the global economy we've already seen what has happened in the red sea how that has disrupted uh, the global trade uh, and if uh, this this uh, war or this conflict was to start expanding then we would have even greater trouble because what what would happen in that case is that uh, the the entire energy economics uh, of the globe goes for a six uh, so there is uh, i think all we can do for now is to keep our fingers crossed and hope things start settling down uh, but you really got to be an optimist uh, to think that is going to happen.